Um, Michelle Berry is a med professor of medicine and tropical diseases at Stanford University. Um, she's a director for the Center for Innovation in Global Health, uh, senior associate dean for global health at the medical school. Uh, she has done lots of interesting and important things, and I just want to highlight a couple. Um, one of the most prominent is that she has been a pioneer for women in medicine and women in global public health, uh, and has been one of the brainchilds behind a new initiative uh, to increase the role of women in global health leadership. Uh, and that, among so many of the things that she's done, will end up being one of her, I think, most important legacies. She's a uh, past president of the Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, um, has over 180 publications. And we were absolutely thrilled when this week, which is a busy week for those people who kind of think about global stuff, it's also UNGA, which is a terrible acronym for the UN General Assembly uh, meeting that's happening in New York. So lots of global health and public health events happening there. And we were very grateful when Michelle agreed uh, to skip some of those and come to us. So Michelle Berry, tonight talking about civil wars and the global threat of pandemics. Thank you so much. That's very sweet. Very sweet. Absolutely. Um, Thank you, Ashish. That was an incredibly sweet introduction. Um, and it's an honor to be here. Um, so I'm going to start with a story. As Ashish mentioned, I am a tropical disease doctor. Um, and I really got interested in the concept of pandemics when one day one of my professors, who is a visiting professor from the Institute Pasteur, came to me with an illness that wound up being a hemorrhagic virus uh, that he had smuggled into Yale during his sabbatical. <laughs> Within 24 hours, um, he essentially had infected over 100 people, uh, including myself. And so it was quite clear to me how rapidly a disease, a deadly disease, um, could spiral. And so I became very interested um, in hemorrhagic diseases. So, Another story, how one goes from pandemics or from Yale to civil wars, which I'm at Harvard, that can't be that hard to figure out, um, is basically um, the reason is that I would like to give credit to Carl Eikenberry, who is, uh, was the general in command of Afghanistan, who with Paul Wise got me very interested in trying to figure out why many of these pandemics seem to erupt in areas of fragile states or civil war and conflict. So that's what I'd like to spend um, the next 45 minutes or so on. And then I want to open it up um, really to questions, because I think there are a lot of questions that I hope this talk will engender. So first, a definition about pandemic. It's an epidemic or disease that spreads over several countries or continents affecting large numbers of people. But I really, I know all of you know that definition, but what I really would like to direct your attention to is that pandemics ignore borders and they question this whole concept of state sovereignty and governance. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about governance and state sovereignty. I'd like to introduce the topic of interdependent sovereignty and that relates really to the ability of countries to control threats that transcend borders. So I, I, I threw a few of those up there. Air pollution and climate change, they're both obviously with the Paris Accord, we're trying to get our arms not so well with our administration, but we're trying with some shared governance to attack that. And then I think what I'm gonna try to hopefully convince you is that pandemic infectious diseases need to have an approach of shared governance. Pandemics emerge, and these are some of the, when we had our brainstorming think tank at the Freeman Spogli at Stanford, these are some of the issues that um, really came to the forefront that clearly altered ecology, um, human and animal, and I don't know if anyone from the Harvard group at Madagascar is in the audience, but clearly, um, we collaborate with them, but clearly when you go through forests and see how slash and burn and fires um, affect the ecology of how rodents are distributed, it's not surprising that plague becomes a very big problem in Madagascar. When you have globalization, 
clear that the size of a pandemic or the risk of a pandemic goes up dramatically. I like these pictures because I like to think of swine flu over here. Um, but the, actually, the majority of emerging infectious diseases are zoonoses. Um, that's zoonoses being the infection between humans and animals, a spillover. Um, and clearly, even pandemic flu that Ashish talked about is a zoonosis, um, probably that original one coming from a bird. So the history of public health in prevention, I like this word, and if there's anyone Italian, if I'm pronouncing it wrong, Coranta Giorni, which is, it stands for 40 days. And those are the days that a ship needing, needed to anchor in Venice during the Black Plague. The quarantine law of 1878 um, in the US prevented the introduction of yellow fever, cholera, and smallpox. These were considered the big three. And this is what we thought about for many years. Actually, until, and that's a typo, it's actually until 2005, when that, after the, and I think we alluded to SARS, but after SARS occurred, the list of quarantinable diseases increased. And you can see they increased to cholera, diphtheria, yellow fever, smallpox plague, tuberculosis, SARS, MERS, which was Middle Eastern respiratory virus, and hemorrhagic viruses. A little back story about the history of international health regulations. The WHO, which formed in 1948, really um, didn't get their act together about quarantine until about 1951, when they created the International Sanitary Regulations which was the authority to develop sanitary and quarantine regulations, but again, directed to the big three. The ISR was revised to the international health regulations, and these were regulations to include outbreaks of what are now called public health emergencies of international concern, um, or what some of us call PHEIC. And this is really addressing are letting the director general address diseases other than the big three. And this is really, the IHR was set out to say, hey, guys, you need to report and detect diseases and respond to diseases and let us know what's happening. Um, for those of you who are around at the beginning of SARS, it took China really a long time, not only to detect it, but also to actually um, give that information uh, to WHO. So WHO can call a PHEIC and ask the member states to cooperate. So this goes to the main thrust of what I'd like to talk to you. It's clear that the hotspots for emerging diseases are often hotspots for civil conflict. And what Carl Eikenberry, this general, asked me to think about with Paul is why is that? Why is it that civil conflict um, it becomes the area for these emerging diseases. Well, some of them are very obvious. Um, obvious things like interruption of immunizations um, during conflict, and we, we've certainly seen that in Syria with a new outbreak of polio because of the lack of immunization or intermittent immunizations. Right now, and I have a slide on this, um, the polio that's actually circulating in Syria is vaccine uh, derivative polio. We have absent biosurveillance of animal illnesses, and it's really important to know what those little bats are carrying, um, because bats are uh, really a major, major animal when it comes to zoonoses. And disrupted health education. We certainly saw that during the Ebola outbreak, when it really wasn't until we effectively communicated about safe burials and, and how Ebola is transmitted that we were able to stop that epidemic. Civil conflict in, in emerging disease. Well, civil conflict often causes food insecurity. Um, we have a whole center that actually just thinks about food insecurity, so it's very interesting to go back and forth with them about this. But clearly, um, when you have food insecurity, you, tran you transfer um, to the forest, you hunt wildlife, you eat bushmeat, um, and bushmeat becomes a issue, and chimps for those of you who know, chimps were actually one of the earliest outbreaks of Ebola had to do with the eating of a dead chimp chimpanzee, because um, chimps themselves get Ebola. They're not necessarily the reservoir, but they actually get Ebola. Uh, 
When you have conflict, you have kids that don't get enough food. And so you have lowered immunity because of malnutrition. That migration to remote forested areas becomes an issue, as we talked about with food security. But here's an area, um, I think we're talking a little bit on the next panel tomorrow night. But actually, in times of conflict, you have very erratic antibiotic use. And for those of you who know, we have an epidemic now of antimicrobial resistance. And this er erratic antibiotic use, um, and I would argue that erratic donations, humanitarian donations to um, countries in conflict actually exacerbate antimicrobial resistance. And we can talk a little bit later about that. Refugee camps, no surprise, um, really reflect crowding and become amplifiers of disease. Um, right near, right now, uh, the Rohingya um, that are in Bangladesh, in Cox Bazar, the large refugee camp, are having an outbreak of diphtheria. Diphtheria is a completely preventable disease. But because of the lack of immunization in that setting and the lack of antitoxin and the disarray of health infrastructure, we're now seeing I think they've had over 270 cases um, of diphtheria in that refugee camp. And the large Somalia camp in Kenya, Dabad, has an epidemic of cholera going on because we can't get cholera vaccination and good water infrastructure there. So infrastructure, infrastructure really matters. And infrastructure falls apart during conflict so that we get poor sanitation and water contamination. No surprise that we're going to get waterborne diseases, such as cholera. As she um, sort of talked about the 1918, I love this concept, the mother of pandemics. Um, this, is, this is not from me. This is an article um, that actually um, in Lancet that talks about the mother of pandemics and actually a book. And, and again, influenza, it turns out, I found this interesting. I did not know this. I had lots of discussions with Scott Poldowski, who who's on a panel tomorrow night, if any of you are interested. But this strain probably originated in military camps. Now, there's a fight, whether it's a camp in Kansas. Everybody's trying to claim it, UK and France, uh, of the military camps that actually this 1918 strain. Uh, but I actually went back to the history of this. It probably originated it before 1918, but that's a whole story in itself. But what's really important is that military conditions amplified virus transmission with overcrowding and cohabitation with livestock and unhygienic conditions. And as you heard, 30 to 100 million deaths occurred within nine months. Now, we talked about the HIV epidemic, but that's really over 30 years. This is over nine months. This is a true pandemic um, and really high percentage of people dying. Usually when we think about influenza deaths, we think about this U curve, the very young and the very old getting influenza. Um, but actually, in 1918, what we see is a W curve. And what we see is a spike in really the 14 to 35-year-olds. And that was another spike of deaths. It's an interesting story about why that happened. Perhaps a more virulent strain, but the they've been able to actually isolate this from Lucy, in, um, an, an ancient corpse. Um, and it doesn't look like the strain is any more virulent. It may have to do with exposures um, of a, a, a circulating strain of influenza that was very much like the 1918, which protected uh, the very elderly and the young. I put this in New York Times two weeks ago. China has withheld samples of dangerous flu vaccine. This is an incredibly scary um, bug right now, the H7 and nine avian flu specimens. And it, and it just goes to show that all of life is politics, right? Um, because of the Trump tariffs, um, actually, the China has not decided to send any of these viral samples to CDC. This avian flu strain actually has a 40% mortality in China. Um, and really, the international community is at risk so that this, these samples are actually very much needed uh, for research and vaccine development. So again, influenza and pandemics becomes very polit political. And I would like to 
start this conversation at the end on how we can breach this politics. Um, and just to remind you, during, the reason why this is very scary is just with a regular flu, the 2014-15, CDC estimated that 34 million people got the flu, 700,000 were hospitalized, and 56,000 people died. So I look at that number because I'm going to talk to you about Ebola, which is really sexy, and we always think about that with pandemics, but actually that's twice the number of uh, folks that died with Ebola. So again, going back to emerging diseases and conflict, I thought this was a great um, picture that I took from uh, Geyer's um, Emerging Infectious Disease article of areas, the yellow are areas of conflict, and the other little circles of Ebola, Lhasa, Nipah, Hendra are all emerging diseases. And you can see that there's a really good correlation of them popping up where there's areas of conflict. And what I'd like to spend the next five or 10 minutes is give you examples of some of these areas with malaria, polio, Ebola, cholera, and yellow fever, and Marburg. So Ebola, and those are all, as you can see, um, concentrated in areas of conflict. So Ebola, um, I know you've heard a lot about Ebola, a, phy a filovirus, or filovirus, however you pronounce it. Um, again, an unprecedented two-year outbreak with 28,000 cases and 11,000 deaths. The epicenter, as everybody knows, was Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. But I want to talk about why was it Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea? I've spent a lot of time in Guinea. I was a consultant for, not a lot of time, but some time. I was a consultant for them on their malaria control. Um, and I can tell you that it had a weak infrastructure even before um, Ebola broke out. But the collapse of infrastructure, health system surveillance, and lack of trust in government really intensified this outbreak. And again, case study. Um, again, 70% Case fatality, not surprising when you don't have good infrastructure. We only had about an 18% case fatality, but again, we only had a few cases in the US. It was the first Ebola epidemic uh, which documented sexual transmission. Believe me, it was going on before that, but we just didn't know or didn't look. And the cases were diagnosed in 10 countries. So all of these countries were post-conflict. They all had limited healthcare access. Um, and just to give you, I just kind of pulled a little bit of the history. Sierra Leone had a civil war in 1991 through 2002, and the amount of physicians there were two physicians per 100,000. In uh, Guinea, there was a 2009 coup d'etat and had eight physicians per 100,000. And Liberia, a, a country that I have worked in and that I lost two personal friends to Ebola, um, the chief of internal medicine at JFK Hospital and the, the deputy chief, um, they only had two physicians per 100,000 population. In fact, when my colleague died, that was, he was the only trained internist in the country there. So again, past history. But I can't, and I was talking uh, to Dan about this. I, pulled, I put this slide in actually yesterday. Um, because there's, this is the first time we've seen now Ebola during active armed conflict. What I was talking to you before was about post-conflict um, situation. But what's happening now in the DRC is that there's a total of 143 Ebola cases that were just reported um, across North Kivu region of DRC. The Ministry of Health and WHO are frantically attempting to increase surveillance and response. Um, they're trying to set up, uh, they can't do ring vaccination. As most of you know, we do have a very good vaccine um, now operative for Ebola, but it's been very hard to, a challenge to engage um, not only the local community, but how do you get in bed healthcare workers in an area that is such strife, where there's such strife um, it's really a hot spot for emerging violence and armed militants, and it's very difficult to access. And there's tremendous risk of transmission to neighboring countries, Uganda, Rwanda, and South Sudan. I'll talk to you a little bit later about how one might approach this, and, and I think it's an area that we do very poorly 
thinking about is how to um, actually build health infrastructure and how to immunize during times of conflict. Here's a case study from past history, which I, when I put this talk together, found fascinating because I wasn't involved in this. It's Tajikistan and malaria. Um, in the early 60s in Tajikistan, malaria was almost always was eliminated. 92 to 93, civil strife. 100,000 people fled to <coughs> Afghanistan. And as um, some of you may know, it's a malaria endemic area. When they returned, they brought malaria to Tajikistan. And in 1997, 27,000 cases of malaria. Um, fortunately, in 2018, we've been able to eradicate it. But I put this slide up to actually say that population displacement enhances d disease reemergence. And I think this is a really nice case study, um, which shows the full circle of how displacement can actually um, cause uh, pandemics. For those of you involved in Angola uh, and hemorrhagic fever, uh, Angola, as you know, has had 30 years of civil war, which destroyed the health infrastructure completely. In 2004 and 5, they had an absolutely devastating outbreak of Marburg, hemorrhagic fever, um, with rapid uncontrol. That Marburg is very similar to Ebola. It's another phylovirus. Uh, again, probably um, in bats um, as the reservoir. And this was really amplified because of the poor health care and the reuse of syringes. Um, and the really in impossibility of getting community collaboration during this time of conflict. Um, many of you also may know about the yellow fever outbreak that's just finishing in Angola. And for those of you who can't get yellow fever um, for your travel abroad, because there's another epidemic going on in Brazil, um, you will know that if the reason is we diverted most of the yellow fever vaccines to Angola. Many millions of people were immunized for that outbreak. So wait, so my point there is that outbreaks in far places like Angola impact us as well. Um, I like to think that we have a large view in thinking about the whole world, but sometimes you need to bring it home um, and just remember that it, uh, we're all on this planet together. It's all going to impact us. This is, I, I can't say enough about Yemen. Yemen is just a frigging, excuse my language, disaster. Um, we now have um, an amazing, over a million cases of cholera. H has anyone been in a cholera setting where, I mean, it's just horrific to sit there with cholera beds and just have this outpouring of fluid and seeing people die just because you can't replenish fluids. Um, and it's, it's, it's incredibly sad that we can't get in any kind of vaccination because uh, we have a fairly, really good oral cholera vaccine. Um, that can be deployed. And again, because of the conflict, it prevents inter international aid and infrastructure repair. I mentioned a little bit earlier about polio in Syria. It's really interesting how the polio actually got found in Syria. Um, it, the Israelis actually were the first to see the polio case in, in Syria. They, they, were, they monitor their sewage, and they actually picked up uh, the polio virus in their sewage, and that preceded. Again, we have terrible ways of surveillance. It should not be someone, one other country, saying, oh, wow, we see this in our sewage. Um, we need to have an active infrastructure with global governance, and I'll tell you a little bit more about some ideas about that. We're also seeing um, polio in the DRC now. Um, these, are not en these are not endemic countries. It's not like it's Afghanistan or northern Nigeria or Pakistan, the three countries that have wild-type polio left. These are now, because of intermittent polio vaccine, we're now seeing vaccine, polio vaccine uh, paralysis um, because of the poorly uh, poor infrastructure. So ongoing civil war, lack of healthcare infrastructure, and expanding and growing outbreaks. I don't mean to sound repetitive, but it is a repeating story. Um, this is an article that was just um, printed maybe a month ago by colleagues of mine at Stanford. Iran Ben David is the lead. And this shows about armed conflict and child mortality. I threw this in because I thought it was fascinating. Um, what they did was they looked at areas of conflict around the entire world and measured uh, child mortality 
by how many kilometers you were from the area of conflict. And they actually showed that 5 million deaths of children younger than 5 were due to conflict of, in Africa. And actually, they actually mapped it out. If you were within 50 kilometers of an area of conflict, you had a rate of like five to seven times of dying. And that rate still, it still was remained for a good five to eight years after the area, after the time of conflict. Now you can imagine, I hope after hearing a little bit of my talk, that some of that risk is probably not only maternal health, malnutrition, but also infectious diseases and epidemics when you have the breakup of infrastructure. Um, they also, if you're interested, if any of you are interested in my maternal child health, there was an increased risk of stunting and neonatal mortality. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a good article to read about that. When one thinks about health care, you can't not know that in conflicts, people are targeting hospitals and doctors. Um, they're using this. I don't know if, I know Steve Morrison was visiting here. Did he show his movie? On, it's, it's an amazing movie about how many um, um, hospitals have been targeted um, as a tool of war. And really targeting hospitals is really what started the Geneva Conference 153 years ago and led to the creation of the Red Cross. It is the original war crime. But in just three months, and I pulled this data, January through March of 2018, there were 149 attacks, 221 deaths, and 261 injuries. Um, and you can see uh, most of these are in Syria. I know, I'm sorry, you can't read that upside. You have to put your head upside down. Uh, but you can see Somalia, Yemen, South Sudan, Car uh, CAR, Gaza, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Libya, um, all um, areas where hospitals have been attacked. This was a, a quote in the Syrian um, press that one dead doctor kills many. And it, it actually, hey, it makes sense. You're right. Uh, one dead doctor does kill many. Um, and you can see what's um, happening in Syria. There have been 678 attacks um, since the beginning of 2014. Um, if you're interested in that, really go to Steve Morrison, CSIS. It's a fabulous movie if you want to see this movie about attacks on healthcare. I didn't allude to antimicrobial resistance because I consider this a pandemic. This is a non-infectious pandemic. And it has to do with, during conflict, the destruction of health infrastructure, the insufficient quantities of drugs that gets to the person, interrupted treatment, Think about your TB treatment being interrupted. All of a sudden, you see multi-drug TB. Irregular access and lack of training for healthcare workers in how to give antibiotics. And I have to say, I'm going to say a few words about donation, because it drives me crazy, because every time my medical students go out, they try to bring drugs um, and my residents. And I have to say, there is a guidelines for smart donations of drugs. Um, often we give drugs that are uh, not enough for sustainability, not appropriate to the essential drug list, wind up being the cause of a great deal of antibiotic resistance. And you see it in refugee populations. Um, the antimicrobial rates are higher in refugees than any other migrant community in Europe. We're seeing multi-drug resistant TB and extremely drug resistant tuberculosis in these populations. And the military is colonized with multi-drug resistant E. coli, the extended back, well, beta-lactam. So I'd like to sort of move us on to a more positive. I tried to display why I think pandemics occur in uh, times of conflict. So what are some of the solutions and believe me, I would love to open this up to any other thoughts that you have. Well, for the antimicrobial resistance, the non-infection pandemic, there are some potential solutions we can think of. And that's good antibiotic stewardship programs. Um, MSF has done this with point of care, one focal physician giving antibiotics and one pharmacist so that all things get um, pushed through them. Um, and they've been able to successfully reduce hospital antibiotic resistance and expenditure. 
Um, and that's a potential for scale in conflict settings. And there's a nice description of it um, in this. And I, I think these slides will be available because I have all my references on the slides. I hope so. Um, and again, WHO has a great uh, guidelines for do donations, but we need to strategize donations. There's clearly, and I want to have a little bit more talk about this, that weak political legitimacy can undermine public health initiatives. I told you before I worked in Liberia. Um, what happened, and, and Ellen Sirleaf is actually a, a, a colleague and friend, um, but clearly she got killed by going into the township of West Point and trying to quarantine, which is a very poor uh, township because she sent the military in. It was not good optics. It was the right idea to quarantine, but not good optics. Um, you weaken your legitimacy by bringing in the military. So we need to strengthen legitimacy of governments and think thoughtfully how to deploy military or whether we should deploy military. And I want to have that debate a little bit later. There are economic disincentives to report on infectious diseases. And I alluded you know, when SARS happened, WHO, and I give a lot of credit to um, David Heyman, because he was the first person uh, at WHO to call a public health emergency and restrict travel. But it was a huge economic problem um, for those who wanted to go to Hong Kong. Remember, SARS, the epicenter of SARS, well, was in China, but the super spreader went to Hong Kong, and that's where it exploded was it in Hong Kong. Uh, so there was a tremendous economic disincentive to not report it because of the, the consequences. So we need to strengthen um, incentives for reporting and ramifications, ramifications for silence. Um, here's another interesting idea of governance issues that we should think about. How do you vaccinate within a conflict? So here are some strategies. It's a great paper by Nadi in the Journal of Infectious Disease this year, which, shows, which talked about negotiating timeouts for vaccinations, and he gives good examples of that. Hit and runs during days of ceasefire, barrier vaccination zones, or so-called firewalling, military embedding, which I'm uncomfortable about, and we can talk about that um, a little bit later. Local community vaccination, the so-called white helmets that are out in Syria. Vaccinate during border crossings when people cross borders. Uh, and right now, in any of the countries that are having an, um, a polio situation, you cannot leave that country without getting vaccinated uh, for polio when you travel. And vaccinating in refugee camps. So these are some strategies we can think about with governance of vaccinating during conflicts. Clearly, we need to strengthen healthcare infrastructure, and I'm going to ask some of the Harvard people later to talk about ways to do that. We need to strengthen WHO budget. Look at that amount for communicable diseases. I don't know about the Harvard hospitals, but our budget for one hospital at Stanford is more than communicable diseases uh, for the entire world of WHO. There's the Epidemic Pandemic Threats Program that USAID runs, and that's called Predict, identify, prevent, and respond. Predict is um, actually being run at UC Davis, where they actually do surveillance and bushmeat to try to identify new viruses that cause disease. Identify is run at other institutions where they strengthen labs. You try to prevent, diminish risk by education, and then respond by networking all the public health institutions. The global health security agenda, I'll talk to you about a little bit later. I know all of you, well, maybe not all, this whole concept of one health, one health meaning that we have to think about our animals. Um, it's really interesting. When the Ebola outbreak started, um, it was noted that six months earlier, there was a complete die-off of all the gorillas in that area where Ebola broke out in, Kitwip, in the Kitwip. So absolutely decimation of gorillas. So if we watch and keep our animal health and think about our animal health, we should think about that of One Health. And I know that Harvard is very involved with the planetary health movement or the concept of that. And lastly, I want to end with shared global governance and some of the factors about shared global governance. So what are some examples 
and how we fail at shared global governance. And I want to get from the audience about ways that we can make this stronger. Well, the World Health Organization is, to me, it was always up there as the, the epi of shared global governance. But I just told you what an what a absolutely pathetic amount of money they have. Um, they do run the international health regulations. They have many health emergency programs. And I think the wake-up call when they, um, and, and I don't want to get into what the politics were about why it took them so long to respond to Ebola, but certainly a lot of good things came out. I think Ashish, you were involved with the Harvard report after that, Victor Zhao. Many people got together and said, how can we respond to these emergencies better? Um, and so they're now national training programs, they're epidemic response teams, there is emerging pathogen biosafety. The European Center for Disease Control and Prevention is like, it's, it's their CDC. We all know about our CDC, or what we call the disease detectives that go out, and uh, this is ep Epidemic Intelligence Service, EIS officers, um, that go out um, with outbreaks, not only domestically, um, also globally, although um, the Trump administration has not been good about giving money uh, for them to go out globally, which I think is really just one of many things I can talk about. I don't want to talk about the Trump administration. The, the Global Health Security Initiative, um, that's an international partnership that was launched in 2001 uh, to actually enhance global health security between um, developed countries and countries that cannot respond to what I described to you before, the IHR, the International Health Regulations. So we've developed, with this group of countries, toolkits. How do you make a better laboratory? How do you detect quickly? Um, how do you do animal surveillance? Um, so that these are ways to get sample and surveillance data sharing. And lastly, um, I think this is fabulous. This came um, out of Jim Kim's um, and a lot of other people thinking about this, the Pandemic Emerging Financing Facility, um, which is a quick dispersing financing mechanism. Because you know what? Health infrastructure takes money. And when you have a pandemic, you need to mobilize that money really frigging fast. So this is one way to disperse it fast. They have an insurance plan and a cash-ready plan. Um, and if you are an LMIC, a low middle income country, you are actually eligible for this. And I really have to thank G Germany and Japan who stepped up to the plate along with the World Bank um, and Australia. WHO didn't have much money to put into it. But it demonstrates the global community commitment. They have about $500 million in this to mobilize when an epidemic happens. So I'm going to end my talk and open it up for questions. I was asked to leave about 15 minutes for questions. And I'm ending with, I don't know if anyone knows Larry Br Brilliant. He's a character in the Silicon Valley. I can't believe I'm in, I am actually an East Coast person. <laughs> I spent 35 years at Yale, so it's very hard for me to think about myself in Silicon Valley. But Larry's a character. And I think his quote is fabulous, which says, epidemics are inevitable, but pandemics are optional. And so I'd like to open this uh, discussion up because I'd like to hear ideas that you have to actually helping us think about making pandemics optional. Thank you very much.